In this video, we're going to discuss and demonstrate an approach to somatic dysfunction diagnosis of the ribs. We're going to begin by screening the entire rib cage to determine any areas uh, of obvious restriction, and then we're going to return to each of those restricted areas and uh, evaluate for segmental rib dysfunction. I'm going to be pushing on a few areas of your ribs, starting from the top here uh, by your neck, in your armpits, along your sides, also in the middle of your chest here by your sternum, and along your back. Let me know if anything is tender or if you're uncomfortable, if you need me to stop at any point. Is that okay? Yes. All right. So go ahead and lie on your back. All right. So now as we begin the screening process, it can be helpful to begin uh, using a little bit of translation to determine if there are any particular areas that stand out with any obvious restriction. So we're going to have our, you put your hands right down here, and we're going to make our contact along the mid-axillary line and starting from the inferior part of the costal cage, and then we're going to move up towards the armpit. Because we're going to be moving into a sensitive area, it's important for us to be clear with our patient and uh, clarify what we're going to be touching. So I'm going to be using the tips of my fingers along the side of your ribs, and I'm going to be pushing from side to side all the way up into your armpits. You let me know if anything is tender, okay? Okay. All right. So now, initiating our contact, we're going to want to keep our thumbs pointing outwards, and we'll make contact along that mid axillary line and the inferior uh, margin of the ribs, and then we're going to translate medially essentially tossing the torso back and forth and moving up uh, rib group by rib group. And as we're doing that, we'll be able to assess for any areas of obvious restriction. And as I'm doing that, I can feel these lower ribs here on the left seem to be pretty uh, restricted. And as I move up a little bit further and I get into this right axilla, I feel this group of ribs right here uh, feels a bit restricted. So now we're going to be moving on to the next stage of our uh, screening, which is screening for respiratory dysfunction. So now, starting at the head of the table, we're going to want to make sure that our table is at a good height and our chairs at a good height so that we can be comfortable throughout our exam. We're going to start by making contact with uh, rib one. We're going to slide our hands posterior near C7 and T1. Take our thumbs find the trapezius muscle, and then we're going to press inferiorly through the muscle down until we meet the bony posterior aspect of the ribs. And now here, making contact with rib one, we're going to ask our patient to uh, breathe in and out. So go ahead and breathe in and out. And we're going to be observing what rib one is doing during each phase of respiration. So, as she breathes in, I feel that both ribs seem to move superiorly equally, and during exhalation, there seems to be a little bit of a restriction on this right side where it lags behind the left side um, during exhalation. So again, one more deep breath. And out. Okay, so again, a little bit of restriction in exhalation on this rib one on the right. So now for an alternate contact on rib one, we can place our hands gently on the shoulders, take our thumbs and move them just posterior to the clavicles and we'll find rib one as it descends behind the clavicle towards the sternum. So now making our contact right on rib one, we can go through those same respiratory cycles. Go ahead and breathe in and out. And again, because we're more on the more anterior aspect of the ribs, we can feel a little bit more of that pump handle motion. And again, during inhalation, they're moving pretty equally. During exhalation, this right side seems to lag behind. As our next option for rib one, uh, we can also make a three-point contact. Our thumbs can be on the posterior aspect of rib one, our index fingers just behind the clavicles, and our middle fingers can be just anterior and inferior to the clavicles where rib one peeks through and inserts into the sternum. So now with this contact, we would be expecting rib motion to be a little bit more superior, but also accentuating that pump handle motion. So again, making our contact. And go ahead and take a breath in and out. So again, during inhalation, I'm feeling good pump handle motion bilaterally. And during exhalation, this right side seems to lag just 
slightly behind, indicating a restriction during exhalation. Good. So now moving on to our next region, ribs two through five. So if our patient was a male patient, we would be able to make a little bit more broad contact with our thumbs along the sternum and the rest of our fingers draping along the costal cage. Now with our female patient, we want to make sure to avoid making uh, overt contact with breast tissue so that they're more comfortable. Um, so we're going to use our hypothenar eminences uh, along the uh, sternum on both sides. Because again, we're entering a more sensitive area, we want to be clear with our patient on where our hands are going to be and what we're going to be doing. I'm going to be using the, uh, this side of my hands um, uh, just along uh, your sternum on both sides, kind of in the center of your chest. Uh, let me know if you're uncomfortable or if anything hurts you, okay? Okay. All right. So again, we're going to make contact right along the sternum, uh, palpating each costochondral junction, and the heel of our hand is more on uh, rib two, and our little fingers are reaching all the way down to about rib five. And we're going to have our patient go through each uh, phase of inhalation and exhalation. Go ahead and breathe in and out and in. So during inhalation, I'm feeling good symmetric motion. And during exhalation, I feel like this right side seems to lag behind a bit. That tells us that this region seems to have a little bit of a restriction during exhalation and a freedom during inhalation. So now moving on to our next region, we're going to make contact again in the axilla. So uh, I'm going to be putting my fingers in your armpits and my hands along your side, okay? So now we're going to be inserting our fingers into the axillae and using our hypothenar eminences uh, along the mid-axillary line on the costal cage. And we're going to be feeling uh, from ribs three down to about rib seven. So go ahead and take a breath in and out. And again, I'm feeling during inhalation, we have pretty symmetric motion, and during exhalation, the left side moves down first, and then the, the right side seems to lag behind. For our next region, we're going to be moving down to the uh, lower ribs uh, to evaluate ribs 7 through 10. So we're going to place our thumbs and thenar eminences along the inferior costal margin, and then we're going to let our fingers drape along uh, the sides, and then go ahead and take a breath in and out. And in each phase, we're going to be evaluating, again, for symmetry of motion. And during inhalation, I'm feeling like there's a little bit of a restriction on this left side where it lags behind the right side. And during exhalation, both sides seem to move more symmetrically, which suggests a restriction during inhalation and a freedom of motion during exhalation on this left-hand side. Now, as we advance in our palpatory skills, we'll be able to assess rib 11 and 12 from this position with our hands draping on ribs 11 and 12 and then evaluating uh, motion during inhalation and exhalation. But uh, as we begin learning our palpatory skills, it can be helpful to visualize as well as palpate in order to validate our experience so we can learn uh, more accurately. So go ahead and flip onto your belly. So now with our patient in a prone position, we're going to make contact with ribs 11 and 12. We're going to use our middle finger and ring finger and find ribs 11 and 12 near the inferior costal margin. Our thumbs are going to rest uh, right around uh, T11 and T12. And then we're going to ask our patient to breathe in and out. Now, due to the caliper motion of ribs 11 and 12, we would expect that during inhalation, ribs 11 and 12 are going to move down and out, so that would be uh, inferior and posterior, so inferior and posterior, and during exhalation, we would feel them move anterior and superior, and we're going to be monitoring that motion, so go ahead, and out. And I'm feeling mostly symmetric motion on both sides, uh, so that's not really an area that seems to be restricted for us. So now that we've thoroughly screened our rib cage, we're going to go back to our previous areas of restriction and determine which specific ribs are involved in our somatic dysfunction. So go ahead and flip over into your back. So now again for ribs two through five, we can start uh, in the parasternal area. 
So I'm just going to put my hands here in the middle of your chest, all right? Okay, now big breath in and out. So now I can start rib by rib and rib two seems to be moving symmetrically during inhalation exhalation. Rib three seems to be uh, symmetric in inhalation and seems to lag behind in exhalation. Moving down to rib four. Again, rib four seems to be restricted during exhalation. Rib five also seems to be restricted during exhalation. And rib six seems to be moving symmetrically during inhalation and exhalation. We can also confirm by moving back to the axillae. So fingers in the armpits. So deep breath in and out. So again, we're feeling rib three on this right side moving well during inhalation and restricted during exhalation. Moving down to rib four. And again, we find that restriction during exhalation. And again, rib five, a restriction during exhalation. And then rib six seems to move symmetrically during each phase. So that suggests that our dysfunctional rib group is ribs three to five on the right side. There is a freedom of motion in inhalation and a restriction of motion in exhalation. Because we name our somatic dysfunctions by their freedom of motion, our somatic dysfunction would be ribs three through five inhalation dysfunction. In terms of the key rib, for inhalation dysfunctions, we can think of that bottom rib as the rib that's responsible for keeping the uh, other ribs up in an inhalation position. So rib five would be the key rib, and if we treated it, we would expect that ribs three and four would also be able to move into uh, exhalation more readily. So moving down to our other restricted area by ribs uh, seven through 10, we're gonna make our contact and go through each phase of respiration, emphasizing my contact in rib seven. And that seems to be moving pretty well. I'm gonna move down to rib eight. And what I'm feeling for rib eight is during exhalation seems to move pretty symmetrically and during inhalation, it seems to lag behind like there's a little restriction during inhalation. Moving down to rib nine, deep breath in. Again, I'm feeling that there's a restriction during inhalation and symmetrical motion during exhalation. Moving down to rib 10. And I'm also feeling a restriction during inhalation and a symmetrical motion during exhalation. Now that would suggest that we have a group of ribs, ribs eight through 10, that has a freedom of motion during exhalation and a restriction of motion in inhalation. Because we name our somatic dysfunctions by their freedom of motion, that would suggest that our somatic dysfunction is ribs eight through 10, exhalation dysfunction on that left side. Now in terms of key ribs, for exhalation dysfunctions, we should think of the top rib as the rib that's responsible for holding the rest of those ribs down in that exhalation position. So if we treated rib eight, which is the key rib in this case, we would expect that ribs nine and 10 would then be able to move more readily into an inhalation position.